Well, good morning. It's good to see everyone. It's good to have those of you who are joining us online. Um, just to kind of let you know how our church has grown, it's interesting. With COVID, I truly believe that that's what the devil intended to kind of destroy the churches. But the churches have actually got, grown stronger. It, it's interesting, but we've had over 5 million views on our channels. We have 50,000 subscribers just to YouTube. It, it, it's just unbelievable. In fact, I'll tell you how much we've grown uh, in the online. We're actually looking at bringing on another pastor to help us take care of the pastoral care because there's just so many things that need to be done as a result of how God has blessed our church. And it's just amazing. But anyways, you don't care about that. So let, let's get going this morning. <laughs> Several weeks ago, I began a new series on the book of Isaiah, chapter 53. And I'm really excited about this series because no other passage of Scripture in the Bible presents the substitutionary, atoning death of Jesus Christ more clearly than this passage of Scripture, Isaiah, chapter 53. In fact, it answers all of the important questions of soteriology. How many of you know what soteriology is? Soteriology is the study of salvation. In fact, uh, if you talk about being saved, you use the Greek word sozo. Sozo means I'm saved or I save. Soteria is salvation. So soteriology is the study of salvation. But anyways, I want you to understand that Isaiah chapter 53 answers all of the important questions concerning Old Testament soteriology, such as, number one, how can humanity's sin be fully and effectually rectified or redressed without the wholesale condemnation of every sinner? I mean, after all, what does the Bible tell us? It tells us for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We've missed the mark. And once you become a sinner, can you ever be restored to righteousness? That's the big question. Number two, how could any sacrifice be sufficient and when we say be sufficient, we mean to make a full and final atonement. In other words, once and for all. I mean, if you look back in the Old Testament, if you sinned, you were constantly taking your sacrifice to the temple. If you sinned, you need a guilt offering. If you want to enjoy fellowship with God, you bring a burnt offering. There's all these type of offerings because the blood of bulls and goats never quite took away the sin. So it's a repetitive thing. But how in the world could one sacrifice be sufficient to make a full and a final atonement and number three how could a just and holy God redeem sinners without compromising his own perfect righteousness in other words if he's made our sin then how does he remain righteous those are questions the soter soteriology addresses but people this is what makes Isaiah chapter 53 such an important prophecy it provides the answer to sin's dilemma then the answer is penal substitution through the death burial and resurrection of the Messiah also known as the suffering servant now does everyone know what I mean by penal substitution because that term is a very important term if you ever go to Bible college or you ever go to seminary and you take a theology class that term will be used over and over again. So let me define what penal substitution is. If you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. Penal substitution is the term that, the, that theologians use to describe Christ's punishment, him being penalized, in the place of sinners, substitution, thus satisfying the demands of justice so that God can justly forgive our sin, making us at one with him, atonement. Now, let me say that again, and there's a reason why I repeat what I say. I had a person write in and said, Pastor, I really like your teaching, but why do you always repeat things? Well, let me tell you why I repeat things. A good teacher makes sure that they present the most important material in their lectures. And when they test, they want to make sure that you've mastered that information. Now, if you're a piss poor teacher, and yes, that's what I said, <laughs> then when you test... You have these little obscure things that you didn't really mention in class or you just briefly mentioned it. And those are the things you test because you don't want anyone to score 100%. You want to show how brilliant you are. That's a piss poor teacher. 
A good teacher is going to teach you the things that you need to know. And when they prepare the test, they're going to make sure that you have mastered the most important things, that you understand the concepts that they actually delivered in their presentations. So here's what I'm telling you. Every time I say, let me say that again, I'm telling you that if you were sitting in my class in seminary and I was teaching and I said, let me say that again, that's going to be on the test. That makes sense? So let me define penal substitution again. Penal substitution refers to Christ's punishment in the place of sinners, thus satisfying the demands of justice so that God can justly forgive our sin, making us at one with him. Listen to me. Penal substitution is the answer to sin's dilemma. And it's why Isaiah chapter 53 is such an important prophecy. In fact, if you remember, I told you when I first began this, this series in the very first sermon that if we didn't have the Old Testament or the New Testament and all we had was one chapter from the Bible, Isaiah chapter 53, plus historical proof of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, we would have everything we need to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Yeah. I'm not kidding. This one chapter gives us everything we need to know to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. That is how important this chapter is. Now, at the end of this series, I'll explain in detail how Jesus was made our sin so that we might be made the righteousness of God in him, 2 Corinthians 5.21. And in doing so, I'll explain how Jesus never sinned even when he was made our sin. Yeah. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says he made him, talking about Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. Well, if Jesus became our sin, wouldn't that make him a sinner? No. And I'll explain why. In fact, I'll explain how he actually fulfilled all righteousness by being made our sin. If Jesus had not been made our sin, he would not have fulfilled all righteousness. It would have been a sin not to. And I'll explain that. I'll also explain how God legally raised Christ from the dead. I use that term legally and most people don't understand what I mean by legally. Legally means according to the law. If I obtain some type of merchandise and I tell you that I obtained it legally, what I'm telling you is I didn't steal it. I didn't cheat anyone. I did it according to the law. Yeah. Yeah. I want you to understand something. God had to legally raise Christ from the dead. In other words, he had to legally raise him in a sense. He had to raise him according to the law. Leviticus 18.5. The man which doeth these things, referring to the law, shall live by them. And Paul quotes it in Romans chapter 10, verses 4 and 5. And it's quoted again in Galatians. Yeah. And I'll explain how God legally raised Christ from the dead, which in turn made you the righteousness of God in him. And I'll explain all of that when we finish going through Isaiah chapter 53, verse by verse. So, we're finally ready to go through the passage of Scripture verse by verse. But first, you knew this was going to happen. Let me point out a few things that you need to know. First of all, Isaiah chapter 53 is a prophecy about the crucifixion, burial, resurrection, and ascension of the Messiah. And all four elements are clearly revealed in this passage of Scripture. Secondly, Isaiah chapter 53 is a double fulfillment prophecy. It was first fulfilled by Jesus Christ, who is the Messiah. And I'll expound on that as we go through Isaiah 53, verse by verse. But to summarize it, Isaiah 53 is a crystal clear prophecy about the ministry, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ. The second fulfillment will occur at the end of the tribulation, right before Jesus returns. Now, I spent a lot of time on this two weeks ago. So let me just say this. Jesus Christ will not return until Israel as a nation acknowledges that Jesus is and was the true Messiah, and they repent for rejecting him and plead for him to return, at which point Jesus will return. 
But Isaiah chapter 53 will be their confession that they rejected Jesus as the true Messiah and they were wrong. They're acknowledging it. They're confessing it. Thirdly, the Messiah is revealed as the arm of God or the arm of the Lord. Now, let me explain a few things about this Hebraism. The Hebraism is a Hebrew figure of speech. So let me explain something about this figure of speech. In the ancient Middle East, the arm was a symbol of strength and power, and it still is today. You guys think I'm a fat old boy, but I'm pretty strong. I'm not, but my, my granddaughter thinks I am. So when I do something that she thinks is strong, she'll say, Papa, you're strong. And I say, you betcha. Now, why do I do that? Anyone know? I'll tell you why. Flexing your bicep is a symbol of strength and power. And it was that way in the ancient Middle East. The arm of the Lord. The arm of Yahweh. In fact, whenever you see the word Lord in all capitals, that means it's Yahweh. But we translate it arm of the Lord. The arm of the Lord... The arm is a symbol of power and strength. Now, Isaiah begins using this Hebraism throughout his book, but he uses it in a very unusual way. He's using it as if the arm of God is a person rather than a symbol of God's power and strength. Let me give you some examples. According to Isaiah chapter 40, verse number 10, the arm of God rules for him. Notice what it says. Behold, the Lord God will come with might, with his arm, now notice this, ruling for him. Now this doesn't say that God will rule, rule with his arm, in other words, with his power and strength. No, no, no. It says that his arm will rule for him, insinuating or indicating that the arm of the Lord is a person, not a symbol. Yeah. In chapter 51, verse 5, it says that the Gentiles would put their trust in the arm of the Lord. Look at that verse. My mercy and justice are coming soon. My salvation is on the way. My strong arm will bring justice to the nations. In other words, to the Gentiles. All distant lands will look to me and wait and hope for my powerful arm. Why? Because this arm is going to bring forth salvation. It's not his power and strength that's going to bring it. It's a person that's going to bring it. So he uses the arm of the Lord, not as a symbol of strength and power, but as a person. Now look at Isaiah 52.10. It says that the arm of the Lord will provide salvation. It just comes out and says it. Notice it. The Lord has made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations. And all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Now, hopefully you've noticed, as I pointed out, that Isaiah is portraying the arm of the Lord as a person. And who is that person? Well, Isaiah chapter 53, verses 1 and 2 reveal that the arm of the Lord and the suffering servant are one and the same. That's right. Jesus Christ, the suffering servant, is the arm of the Lord, his strength and power. And as the arm of the Lord, he rules for God, Isaiah chapter 40, verse number 10. He brings justice and hope to the Gentiles, Isaiah chapter 51, verse number 5. And best of all, he provides salvation to all that trust in him, Isaiah chapter 52, verse 10. And we'll talk more about this when we get to verses 1 and 2. Because there it says, who hath believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he... Do you see that? For he, not for it. Why? Because the arm of the Lord in Isaiah is a person, not a symbol. And that person is Jesus Christ. And that's what we're going to find out in Isaiah chapter 53, verses 1 and 2. Fourthly, just as Isaiah developed the concept of the arm of the Lord, and then revealed who the arm of the Lord is in chapter 53, he also develops the concept of the servant 
of the Lord, the servant of Yahweh. According to Isaiah chapter 42, verse number 1, the mission of the servant is to benefit, benefit all mankind, both Jew and Gentile alike. In chapter 49, verses 1 through 13, Isaiah tells us that the servant's mission would be difficult. And why is it difficult? Well, in verses 1 through 5, he tells us that Israel will reject the servant of the Lord. People, when Israel rejected Jesus Christ as the Messiah, it had already been prophesied. It was not a shock. And for Paul to go to the Gentiles was not a change of plans because it had already been prophesied. God already knew what was going to take place. So in verses 1 through 5 in chapter 49, he tells us that Israel will reject the servant of the Lord, at which point the servant of the Lord will become a light to the Gentiles, verse number 6. In chapter 50, we're told that the servant would suffer physical abuse, but no reason is given as to why. So we don't know why. Why does he need to suffer? But in chapter 53, we're given the reason why. And then Isaiah goes into great detail concerning the servant's death, burial, and resurrection, and how it benefits us. Anyone who studies Isaiah chapter 53 should understand why the servant had to suffer. Yeah. Fifthly, in Isaiah chapter 52, verse number 3, God promises Israel that they will be redeemed without money. Look at that verse. For thus says the Lord, you have sowed yourselves into the bondage of sin for nothing. And you shall be redeemed without money. Some of you have sowed yourself into the bondage of drugs. Some of you have sowed yourself into the bondage of greed. And what you thought you were selling yourself into was some great gain. You found out you sowed yourself into the bondage of sin for nothing. For nothing. But then notice what it says. And you shall be redeemed without money. But in Isaiah chapter 53, God reveals what the price of redemption will be. If it's not money, then what is it? Well, we're redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. In other words, by the death, burial, and resurrection of the suffering servant. Let me explain something about the blood that most people don't know. You get in the charismatic circles, Pentecostal circles, and people talk about pleading the blood. Well, I just plead the blood. And I have no idea what the blood is. People, the blood is the symbol of life. Leviticus chapter 17, verse number 11 says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar as an atonement for your soul. So here's what would take place. When you sinned and you brought forth that guilt offering and they cut that throat, they would catch that blood and they threw it upon the altar. The altars for the sacrifices, the sacrifices for your sin, the sacrifices that go to God. But it didn't stop there. The blood was thrown upon the altar. But there was more than just dying. Remember I told you, what did Jesus do in hell? And boy, did I get some nasty comments. Jesus said it is finished on the cross. and He didn't have to go to hell. I wish you would have read Isaiah chapter 53 and would understand the book of Leviticus. Because when you took that guilt offering and you threw the blood upon the altar, then you took the fat and certain, certain organs of that animal and you took it and climbed up the steps, or the priest did, and he laid it upon the altar and it was consumed by fire. Why? Because the fat in those certain organs represented or symbolized the soul of the animal. And it was a substitute for you. Its life was given, thrown upon the altar, and then its soul was taken and it was consumed by the judgment or the fire of God. Yeah. And we're going to find out in Isaiah chapter 53 is where it says, And God shall see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. Yeah. Yeah. That's good teaching. Anyways. So, now that you know those things, let's talk about the structure of Isaiah chapter 53. And then we're going to start going through it verse by verse. Isaiah chapter 53 is the fourth servant song in the book of Isaiah. 
The first three are, if you're taking notes, Isaiah chapter 42, verses 1 through 9, Isaiah chapter 49, verses 1 through 13, and Isaiah chapter 50, verses 4 through 9. You can go back and read those on your own. I really don't have time to do that. But all four songs are written in the form of Hebrew poetry. Keep that in mind. All four songs, in which Isaiah 53 is one of them, is written in the form of Hebrew poetry. But these poems are meant to be sung. That's why they're called servant songs. Now, the strong, the, the, I'm sorry, the songs are strophic rather than stickic. Now, let me explain what I mean by that. Stickic poems are made up of lines of the same approximate length and meter. In other words, the poem consists of lines having the same metrical form. Let me give you an example. Mary had a little lamb, little lamb, little lamb. Mary had a little lamb. Its fleece was white as snow. And everywhere that Mary went, Mary went, Mary went. Everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. Did you see that? Proc the same length, same metrical form. Okay, that's, that's a strophic poem. Strophic poems are totally different. Strophic poems, on the other hand, are made up of lines of varying length. So the lines don't follow the same metrical form. Now, the reason that I bring this up is because when you start studying on your own, you'll get confused if you don't know what a strophe is. Because scholars will tell you that Isaiah chapter 53 contains five strophes with three verses each. The reason they're called strophes is because the verses are of varying length and they don't follow the same metrical form. Everyone with me? But basically, here's what they're telling you. They're telling you that it's a Hebrew poem that's supposed to be sung, but the lines don't follow the same metrical form. Now, I'm just going to call them stanzas rather than strophes because most people know what a stanza is, but they have no idea what a strophe is. So, here's what I'm telling you. Isaiah chapter 53 is a Hebrew poem that's meant to be sung, and it contains five stanzas of three verses each. And the verses are of varying length, and they don't follow the same metric form. Now, here's why it's important to know how Isaiah chapter 53 is structured. The first line of each stanza is the theme of that stanza. Yeah. You want to know what the theme of verses 13, 14, and 15 is in chapter 52? Because that's the first one. Read the first line. Want to know what the theme is in verses 1, 2, and 3? Read the first line. You want to know what the theme is in verses 4, 5, and 6? Read the first line. You want to know what the theme is in verses 7, 8, and 9? Read the first line. People, God laid out the Bible in such a way that no man could have ever written it. It is divinely inspired and inerrant. Not only is it fulfilled to the last detail, but it's set up in a way that no man could ever devise it. And this prophecy was given 700 years before Jesus Christ came and fulfilled it. Well... As I said, the first line of each stanza is the theme of that stanza. In the first stanza, chapter, chapter 52, verses 13 through 15, God introduces the servant. The next three stanzas, verses 1, and three, 1 through 3, verses 4 and 6 through 6, and verses 7 through 9, contains Israel's confession of having rejected the servant. In the fifth and last stanza, verses 10 through 12, provides the theology of of the suffering servant. And people, let me tell you, it's good. It's real good. And if you understand it, that's why you realize that if you only had one chapter in the Bible in historical proof that Jesus died, was buried, and was resurrected, you could come to saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Because it gives us everything we need to know. So, Let's start, start going through Isaiah 53, verse by verse, and we'll start with the first stanza, the introduction. 
So turn to Isaiah chapter 52 and let's read verses 13 through 15 because they go together. That's why it's important to know that these are trophies or stanzas. So we'll study them three verses at a time. They all tie together, but you need to understand they're different. They work towards the progression of the final, which is the theology. So let's read verses 13 through 15. Behold, my servant shall deal wisely. He shall be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high. However, like as many were astonished at thee, his visage was so marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths at him. For that which had not been told to them shall they see. And that which they had not heard they shall understand. Now, let's look at the first verse in the first stanza, which is verse 13. Notice that it begins with the word behold. Behold, my servant shall deal wisely. He shall be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high. Behold is translated from the Hebrew word henna, which is used to tell the reader that he needs to pay close attention to what's about to be said. Now, we usually translate this as behold, but it really means pay attention. Or listen to what I'm about to say because it's extremely important. Jesus does this a lot in the New Testament. He'll say, behold, I say unto you. And whenever you see that behold, even though it's written in Greek, it's just like the Hebrew word henna. And it means listen to what I say because it's very, very important. And that's why it starts with the word behold. So, by starting this stanza with the word behold, Isaiah is telling us that this is not just a simple introduction. This introduction sets the tone for the entire Messianic prophecy. And it provides a synopsis of the plot or theme of the prophecy. So, now that we know that, we're not going to gloss over the introduction. This is very, very important. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to pay close attention to what it says. Now, we're only going to get through verse 13, but I want you to understand when I say we're going to pay close attention, because it's a stanza, a strophe, we got to keep these three together. We just won't have time to finish it all. So, look at verse 13 again. Behold, my servant shall deal wisely. He shall be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high. So, there are two things that God wants us to know about the suffering servant. Right off the bat. First, he shall deal wisely. Secondly, he shall be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high. Now, what does it mean, my servant shall deal wisely? Well, I want you to understand that word. I want you to underline that word, wisely. Wisely is translated from the Hebrew word, sakal. And it's a very unusual word, and it's very difficult to translate. Because what it means is to act with such wisdom that one's efforts are successful or productive. Let me say that again. What it means is to act with such wisdom that one's efforts are successful or productive. Now, the reason that I say that it's very difficult to translate is because when you're translating, you can't use a whole sentence to translate one word. If you did, we wouldn't carry a Bible to church. We would carry four big volumes, maybe six. So translators have to make a decision. When they get up to a word... And they realize to really understand this word, I need to use a sentence. They can't do that. They got to choose one, maybe two words, possibly three, to really convey what that word means. So this word is really difficult to translate. And that's why when you compare different translations, they're so different. The New American Standard says, my servant will prosper. The NIV, NIV says, my servant will act wisely. Well, which is it? Will the servant act wisely or will he prosper? Well, the truth is, neither one of them is right unless you combine the two. Yeah. Because the Hebrew word sakal means to act with such wisdom that one's efforts produce success or the ultimate goal. That's very important. I'm going to show you why in just a minute. 
You say, Pastor, you're spending a lot of time on this. That's kind of boring. It's not going to be boring in just a second. Especially when I get to the end and I start making an application. So what this is saying is the servant will both know and do all the right things in order to accomplish the purpose for which he was called. Let me say that again because it says that the servant will deal wisely. And you look at that and you go, what does that mean? It means that the servant will do and know all the right things in order to accomplish the purpose for which he was called. Yeah, he will deal wisely. And as a result, he shall be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high. Look back at verse number 13 so you can see what I'm talking about. Behold, my servant shall deal wisely. He'll know and he'll do all the right things in order to accomplish the ultimate goal. And as a result, he shall be exalted and lifted up. And she'll be very high. In other words, because he shall act wisely, he shall be exalted and lifted up and she'll be very high. Now, those phrases are not synonyms. Isaiah is not being redundant for emphasis. Sometimes writers do that. Sometimes we do that. You kids don't listen to what I say. I'm going to bust your butt. I'm going to take a switch to you. I'm going to whoop your fanny. For emphasis, you were being redundant, right? And sometimes when we read things like that, we think, well, he's just being redundant for emphasis. No, 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 no. He's not. These phrases are escalating statements. They are different words indicating progression. We have different words that indicate progression in English. Good, better, best. Three different words. And you know by those words that there's different levels. There's a progression. Do you like what I bought you? Yeah, it's good. Oh, you don't really like it. Oh, no, it's better than that. Yeah, it's better, but it's not... Oh, I love it. It's the best. You see what I'm saying? These are three different Hebrew words. And these phrases, they're translated as phrases, are escalating statements. Going from high to higher to highest. Yeah. And they're meant to parallel the historical fulfillment of Christ's glorification after his suffering. In other words, Christ's resurrection, high, his ascension, higher, being seated at the right hand of God, highest. Do you see? Now, remember, the first line in each stanza is the theme of that stanza. So I want you to notice what verse 13 is saying. He's giving us the theme for verses 13, 14, and 15. Everyone with me? So notice what verse 13 is saying. Behold, pay attention. This is important. My servant shall deal wisely. He'll know and do all the right things in order to accomplish the purpose for which he was called. Therefore, I added that. He'll be exalted, resurrected, and lifted up, ascending. And she'll be very high, seated at the right hand of the Father. But listen to me. Before he can be exalted, he must suffer. Because we're not going to be redeemed with money. We're going to be redeemed by the precious blood of the Lamb. And before he can be exalted, before these three levels, he has to suffer. It is only through his suffering that the ultimate goal is accomplished and he's exalted. Now, listen to me. Verse 13 tells me Jesus knows that. Yeah. 
He can't be resurrected high, ascending higher, seated at the right hand of the Father highest, without having first suffered. And Jesus knows that, and that's why he acts wisely, which takes us to verse 14. And I'm going to read it out of the NLT because it's actually a better translation. Notice I use that word better. It's not just a good translation, it's a better translation. I'm not going to say it's the best, but it's a better one. Here goes. But many were amazed when they saw him. His face was so disfigured. He seemed hardly human. From his appearance, one would scarcely know. He was a man. By the time he was crucified, he had been lashed, he'd been beaten. Psalms tells us that they jerked the hair out of his beard, that his face was just a bloody mess. Eyes shut closed from swelling, nose broken, lips pulverized, covered in blood, ripped open in the front and the back from the cat of nine tails. So he hardly looked human. But only Jesus knew that his suffering must precede his glorification. He knew that only through his suffering would he accomplish the ultimate goal, our redemption and salvation, which will bring about our glorification and at his return restore all things back to the way it was before the fall. Now, listen to me. Behold! <laughs> Pay close attention. What Jesus had to do in order to accomplish his mission was so contrary to our way of thinking that no one expected him to suffer the way that he did, even though he plainly told them that he would. Yeah. People, he told his disciples exactly what was going to happen. It's not going to come up on screen. I'm just going to read it for you. The first one is in Matthew 16, verse 21. And there's many others, but I'm just going to read Matthew 16, 21 and two others. One from each of the Gospels. Here's what it says. From then on, Jesus began to tell his disciples plainly that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem. And that he would suffer many terrible things at the hands of the elders, the leading priests, and the teachers of religious law. He would be killed. But on the third day. He would be raised from the dead. But Peter took him aside. Actually, at that time, he was Simon. And began to reprimand Jesus, saying, Heaven forbid, Lord, this will never happen to you. Notice what Jesus does. Jesus turns to Peter, and he said, Get away from me, Satan. You are a dangerous trap to me. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. Because, you see, from a human point of view... When we think of the Messiah who's going to come and he's going to sit on the throne. He's the son of David. He's going to restore Israel like it was in its days of glory. And he's going to rule over every nation with a rod of iron. And he's going to fulfill every promise that God has made to the Jews. And he's going to restore all things back to the way it was before the fall. The way it was in the Garden of Eden. We can't imagine that you got to suffer for that. In order to do that, you have to come as a conquering king. Yeah. So when Jesus tells Peter, he says, and all of his disciples, I've got to be rejected. I have to suffer. And I have to die. But on the third day, I'll rise again. His disciples, especially Peter, he reprimands Jesus. He says, that's not going to happen. And Jesus says, it's because if you were the Messiah, you wouldn't deal wisely. You would know that suffering must precede glorification. And you wouldn't do what's necessary to redeem us. But you need to understand, I can't be glorified until I first suffer. Yeah. Keep going. This is Mark chapter 9, part through verse 31, start in the middle. 
He said to them, the Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of his enemies. He will be killed, but three days later, he will rise from the dead. Now listen to what else it says. They, talking about the disciples, they didn't understand what he was saying. However, and they were afraid to ask him what he meant, but they didn't understand it, even though it plainly states it. You go through the Old Testament and you see all of the scriptures that talk about what Jesus is going to have to do. But it's something that we can't comprehend. Because if you're going to be victorious, you have to win. You can't be victorious if you lose. And you know, Jesus says, I got to lose before I win. I got to lose for you because you're losers. I've got to take your punishment. I have to bear your sin. Penal substitution. I've got to be penalized for what you've done. So that God can justly forgive you. Because if sin is not punished, then God cannot justly forgive you. And you can never be made righteous. So Jesus says, Peter, you have no idea. I got to lose before I win. And that's why Isaiah 52, verse number 13, so important. Behold, listen to me, this is important. He shall deal wisely. And if you don't know what that word means, you have no idea what it's saying. It's saying that he'll know and he'll do all the right things in order to accomplish the purpose for which I've called him. And you know what? That couldn't be said of anyone else because in our mind, if you're going to be a winner, you got to win. If you're going to be victorious, you have to be the victor. There is no way. And Paul comes on and he picks up this theme all the time. He talks about Jesus on the cross and how that's a stumbling block. And he's going to be numbered with the transgressors. Yeah, let me read you one more. This is in Luke. This is chapter 9, verse 21. Jesus warned the disciples not to tell anyone who he was. The Son of Man must suffer many terrible things, he said. He will be rejected by the elders, the leading priests, and the teachers of religious law. He will be killed, but on the third day he will be raised from the dead. I thank God for Jesus. You know, people think all he did was he died on a cross. And even Calvin wrote this. I'm not a fan of Calvin. Most of you know that. But he was a good theologian on many things. He said, all Jesus did was die on the cross. You're still in your sin. When Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he sweated huge drops of blood, not because he was going to the cross. That was bad. That would have given him anxiety, I can guarantee you. But there were two thieves on either side of him that were nailed to the cross too. You want to know why he was sweating huge drops of blood? It's because he was going to be made sin for everyone. And he was not only going to bear your punishment on the cross, but he was going to descend to hell to pay your punishment because, as we're going to find out in Isaiah 53, Jesus was a guilt offering. And his soul had to travail in order for God to be satisfied. And Leviticus tells us exactly what a guilt offering has to do, which means that their soul has to be placed upon the altar and has to be consumed with fire to pay for all of our sin. No one deserves to be exalted like Jesus. Because Jesus came into this world knowing what he had to do. And he did it. Let's stand. People come to me all the time. They'll say, Pastor Al, what do I have to do in order to be saved? And I, I say this many times. I say, you don't have to do anything Jesus did at all. And it's really true.
But then I turn around and it's almost like a paradox. The only thing you have to do is you just have to receive the free gift of salvation. You do one of two things. You either reject Jesus and his free gift of salvation, or you receive Jesus and his free gift of salvation. But the truth of the matter is, all you have to do is believe. Jesus has done everything. He's done everything. But that's also why I tell people, don't, don't buy into that good old mentality. Someone dies and they're a good person. Well, they're a good person. I'm sure they made it to heaven. Let me tell you something. None of us are good. For all of sin to come short of the glory of God, we have not lived up to God's standard to be able to get into heaven. And that's why Jesus came. He came for penal substitution. He came to be penalized for your sin. Pay your penalty, substitution, so that God can justly forgive you because of what Jesus did. So if you're here this morning, you've never received Jesus, I'm gonna give you the opportunity I say this, it's not the prayer that saves you. I'll say, if you want to receive Jesus, just repeat this prayer after me. Like this prayer will all of a sudden change you. No, 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 no. It has nothing to do with the prayer. It has to do with you believing what you're saying. If you will believe in Jesus, that he's the Messiah, that he died for your sin. And after all the sins were paid for, God raised him from the dead. Yeah exalted very high highest if you believe that confess him as Lord Jesus did it all and you're saved I want everyone here bow their heads close their eyes if you're online and you want to receive Jesus just repeat this prayer after me if you're here just repeat this prayer you can even say it silently to yourself here it goes God I know I'm a sinner and I know that my sin has separated me from you. But God, I believe you love me. And you had a plan to save me. And that plan was Jesus. I believe, God, that you sent your son Jesus to die for my sin. And I believe that when Jesus died, his soul descended into hell to pay the penalty for my sin. But I also believe that when all my sin was paid for, God raised you, raised Jesus from the dead. Jesus, I believe in you. I want to receive your free gift of salvation. I want you to be Lord of my life. Thank you for saving me. Now, with every head bowed, every eye closed, if you said that prayer for the first time and meant it, if you're putting your faith in Jesus, I want you to raise your hand right, high right now. No one's looking but me. You're confessing that Jesus is your Lord. Anyone? Anyone at all? If you're online and you said that prayer, I want you to type in the words, Jesus. That lets us know that you said that and you're confessing Jesus as Lord.